Three, two, one. Boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. America is heading back to the moon. NASA's most powerful rocket ever, the Artemis One, blasting off earlier this week. The 322-foot rocket, the most powerful ever built by NASA, will attempt to send the Orion spacecraft into lunar orbit. The Orion is expected to fly by the moon in just a couple of days on November 21st, performing a close approach of the lunar surface on its way to a distant retrograde orbit, a highly stable orbit approximately 40,000 miles beyond the moon, and then return to Earth over the course of the next several weeks. The mission marks a major step toward putting astronauts back on the lunar surface for the first time since the end of the Apollo program 50 years ago. Who better to discuss NASA's latest attempts to boldly go where few have gone before than former NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Administrator. We, uh, we appreciate it. You, you were there at NASA when the Artemis program began. I think this is really exciting for the country. Talk to us about the program and the importance of this mission. Yeah, so this was an initiative of the Trump-Pence administration. Um, it was a plan to go back to the moon, this time sustainably. In other words, we're going to stay. We're going to go with commercial partners, with international partners. We're, in fact, we've already built the largest coalition of international partners um, in the history of NASA for any program, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but we're also going with commercial partners. We're going to use the resources of the moon to live and work for long periods of time on the surface of the moon. In other words, we're going to use the water ice that's very prevalent, especially on the south pole of the moon. Huh. Water ice is H2O. It's, it's hydrogen, which is fuel. It's oxygen, which is you know, there for us to breathe. Of course, water is necessary to, to drink. Um, so there's, there's lots of resources there. There's sunlight uh, that's available for power on the moon, but ultimately we're going to have to have additional power sources. Um, but we're going to go and we're going to stay. We're also going with all of America. The Artemis program is named after the twin sister of Apollo, and she was, in fact, the goddess of the moon. This time when we go to the moon, we're going with the first woman and the first person of color, um, which is exciting. Our astronaut corps now is very diverse and inclusive. Um, so this, uh, this is an exciting time. This is what great nations do. We lead the world. And, yeah. um, of course, the, the Trump-Pence administration initiated this, but yeah. the, the Biden administration continued it. So it, it, Artemis is about... Uh... Uh, it's about a third, it's two thirds of the way there. And so in a couple of days, it'll enter into orbit. But talk to us how Artemis I differs from the previous rocket that took Americans to the moon, that Saturn V. Well, a lot of the components of the, of the SLS, which is the name of the rocket for the Artemis I mission, the SLS, a lot of the components came from the space shuttle program. So we've modified the space shuttle main engines. You can look at the the solid rocket boosters on the side of the vehicle, they look very similar to the solid rocket boosters from the space shuttle. Um, but generally, this is, this is the most, well, this is, in fact, the most powerful rocket ever in the history of the world. It's going to be able to carry more mass and, and more payload um, to, to the moon than, than any rocket in history. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we need that ability because we're going to build what's called the gateway in orbit around the moon. Think of a space station in orbit around the moon that's that where astronauts are going to be able to, to live and work for long periods of time and, and go back and forth to different parts of the moon. We're going to have access to the entirety of the moon anytime we need access to any part of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, a, this is a mission that is sustainable. And we're also, this is the yeah. key thing, we're learning how to live and work on another world for long periods of time because we're going to go to Mars. Yeah. And if you're going to go to Mars, you're going to, you're going to have to live there for a period of time because once you get there, you're not going to be aligned on the same side of the, of the sun with the Earth. So you've right. got to stay for a period of almost two years before coming back. Um, and that's really yeah. what we're doing right now. We're proving that we can live and work on another world for long periods of time so that ultimately uh, we can make the journey to Mars. Jim, it does feel like after the shuttle program was ended that the U.S. kind of took a step back, or at least in the consciousness, we kind of took a step back. We were using Russian rockets to get astronauts to the space station and such. People were saying more and more, why do we continue to do this? Why is it important for the U.S. to continue to invest in space exploration? There are going to be amazing discoveries to be made. We think about my time at NASA. We discovered 
that Mars, for example, is covered in complex organic compounds. The building blocks for life are all over Mars. They're not on the moon at all. We discovered that methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. We discovered that there's liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. All of these things keep increasing the probability mm -hmm. that we will find life on another world, which has never been done before. Mm -hmm. In my view, if that discovery is to be made, and now we're seeing massive plumes of methane coming from Mars, which again is an indicator that it could be life. If a discovery like that is to be made, it should be made by the United States of America and our allies and partners, because it will forever add chapters to history books mm -hmm. and science books. And we need to make sure that the United States of America and our partners are leading the world in this endeavor. Yeah, Jim, one last question for you. And you talk about the fact that we do this as kind of a coalition of, of our partners now. Russia and China, however, two geostrategic competitors of ours, are now collaborating on a possible moon mission and moon base of their own. In your opinion, is there a threat to America's dominance in terms of space and space exploration based on that new cooperative? And, uh, and, and is that alone a reason to continue to really push forward with this in a very ambitious way? Yes, the answer is yes. Very simply, we look at the threats to space. People don't realize how dependent we are on space as a nation. Uh, the way we do communication, think about this right now. We're, we're communicating right now through um, a camera in my computer that was uh, basically built for a Mars lander you know, decades ago and then eventually put into cell phones. But it's not just that. The way we communicate, the way we navigate, the way we produce food and energy, do disaster relief, national security, banking. A lot of people don't realize every banking transaction in this country is dependent on a timing signal from GPS. Same with the power grid, dependent yeah. on a timing signal from GPS. Yeah. Same as terrestrial wireless networks. Look, there is a reason that our competitors around the globe are launching anti-satellite missiles. There's a reason that they're developing co-orbital anti-satellite capabilities. Mm -hmm. Our way of, look, if we lose banking in this country, there will be no milk in the grocery store in a matter of days. Yeah. If we lose the, the energy, the power grid, um, it, it shuts down our economy. This is yeah. an existential threat to our country. This is why we, when I was in the House of Representatives, we created the Space Force. Right. Um, these are these are critical things. Now, yeah. here's the thing. Most of what the Space Force does is not going to be open to the public for everybody to see, but people yeah. need to see what we are doing. And when they see what NASA does, I think it, it lets everybody know that we're in a good position I, I, um, technologically and we will remain superior. I, I think it's so important for people to realize that it really does touch every aspect of their lives. Uh, our space program can be a real source of pride for this country again. I really believe that. I think Artemis and Orion are a great story. We're going to continue to follow it here at Newsmax. Former NASA Administrator and former Congressman Jim Bridenstine, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. No crooked, crooked establishment. None of that twisting the truth. No talking down don't to me. Tell me don't tell me how to think. Don't tell me how to think. Don't tell me how to think. I trust Newsmax. Newsmax. They don't tell, tell me how to think. think. They let, let me decide. Newsmax. Real news. For real people.